great to have uh, Mr. Leonis has come in and spend some time with us. It's just absolutely great. Now it's my honor to introduce our next speaker. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was established to protect American consumers from unfair, deceptive, or abusive practices at the hands of financial services providers, banks, credit card companies, mortgage and payday lenders, and debt collectors, just to name a few. So I have been a strong supporter of it from the time it was first imagined by Elizabeth Warren, and I believe it has since proven its value many times over. This agency has been especially valuable to service members and their families, who are often at risk of being targeted by unscrupulous lenders. Holly Petraeus, our next speaker, leads the Bureau's, Bureau's Office of Service Member Affairs. The office is charged with making sure that those who serve in the military are able to focus on their jobs and their families without having to worry about getting trapped by abusive financial practices. As a member of the Military Personnel Subcommittee of the House Armed Services Committee, a member of the Congressional Military Families Caucus, and a co-chair of the Bipartisan Savings and Ownership Caucus, which is devoted to encouraging financial literacy, personal savings, and economic mobility, I know how important it is, that the, how, the, these, how important these issues are to our service men and women. Holly understands the challenges facing military families even more personally. Her son, her brother, her father, her grandfather, her great-grandfather, and her husband all served in our armed forces. Prior to serving at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, she was the director of the Better Business Bureau Military Line, a partnership between uh, the BBB and the Department of Defense Financial Readiness Campaign that provides consumer education and ad advocacy for service members and their families. Both her personal and professional experience, her experience make her a great fit uh, for the job she holds at the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And she is a great voice for our military families and American families in general. Military families have unique challenges, and now they have a unique advocate to ensure that their special concerns get the attention they deserve. Please join me in welcoming Holly Petraeus. Good morning, all. Um, I have to say thank you, first of all, to the Congresswoman for inviting me to come and join you today. Um, you could have picked an easier act for me to follow. Um, <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be somebody who was, had such low Massachusetts credentials, uh, among a few other things. But I want you to know, I have Massachusetts credentials too. Uh, my dad was actually born just outside of Boston, grew up in Massachusetts, and uh, he came from a family of lawyers. And uh, the interesting fact about that family of lawyers is that his grandfather was the prosecuting attorney on a very famous case, the Lizzie Borden axe murder case. <laughs> so now you think that gives me some big state status? <laughs> I think so. And also my son, the one who's in the Army now, did go to college in the Boston area and uh, really wants to go back for grad school one day. He loved it up there. So. Uh, we're all fans of Massachusetts, and uh, certainly um, you have great representation as well, and I'm a fan of them as well. So, um, you heard about me as a longtime military family member and the former director of the Better Business Bureau's military line program. But since 2011, I have had a new role, um, the assistant director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, heading up the Office of Service Member Affairs. And I guess I should apologize in advance, unlike my predecessor at the podium, because I work for the government, I do have to get my speeches cleared. So if I occasionally sound like a law review article, you will know why. It's because I have to say things a certain way. But uh, I basically have three things I'm supposed to do in my office, and they were actually written into the Dodd-Frank statute specifically. The first is to see that military personnel and their families receive a strong financial education so they can make better informed consumer decisions. The second is to monitor their complaints about consumer financial products and services that come into us and the responses to those complaints. And the third, which is a pretty big umbrella, is to coordinate the efforts of federal and state agencies to improve consumer protection measures for military families. 
The Consumer Financial Protection Act that created my office defines service members as active duty, reserve, or national guard. But my office works for retirees and veterans as well. I think the CFPB serves all consumers, and my office should serve all who have worn the uniform and their families. So we do that. And I'm happy to see some uniforms in the audience today. And uh, any veterans out there as well, show of hands. Well, I think they deserve a round of applause, all of you. Obviously, the Department of Defense has a whole lot of people providing financial education, and I can tell you that I do not intend, with my massive staff of nine people, uh, of trying to replace them in that effort, or even duplicate their efforts. But I do think we can fill in some gaps and provide some expertise. And one of the first things I did after starting this job was to go take a look at the financial classes that they get in basic training, because there is a requirement that the military get financial classes at basic training. I have to tell you, it's kind of interesting to go and look at. Um, any Marines out there in the audience? No? Well, I have to tell you, the Marine Corps class was the only financial class I've ever attended where the students periodically shouted, kill. It's <laughs> <laughs> a Marine thing. Um, my assistant and I were like, did they just say kill? Yes, yes they did. Okay. Uh, but regardless of their enthusiasm, uh, basic training is not a great time to take a financial class. They're tired, they're stressed, they're worried about their next meal and scared of the drill instructor. And if you put them in a chair and you put up a PowerPoint, what do you think happens? Yeah, they go to sleep, of course. <laughs> in fact, I, sometimes I do an informal poll and ask, um, you know, NCOs, any of you remember that class in basic training? And they all just look at me blankly. So we thought, what could we do maybe to help? And uh, we've been working on an education module that they can do online before they even get to basic training. The military has something called delayed entry, where they've committed to join the military, but they don't go to basic training for a while. And it can last from a month to over a year. And we thought that might be a good opportunity to catch them while they're under less stress and before they get that first military paycheck. So we're working on the design. We're trying to make it um, interesting and engaging. We certainly don't have the money to do some really cool video thing, but uh, we're trying to make it look kind of like a graphic novel. And um, we have an initial prototype developed, and we hope to expand it out to a full module that's ready for testing by the end of this year. And then we have another project in the works, which is for the other end of their time in the service. It's an initiative to provide financial coaching to those who've recently transitioned to veteran status. Um, the concept is to provide a warm handoff to those who may have left the military with a plan, because the military is encouraging that through the Transition Assistance Program, but they may find when they get out that the plan doesn't quite fit the reality of their new situation. So our intent is to have this contract deliver financial coaching by certified financial planners to individual transitioning veterans, but when I say individual, we certainly would want, if they're married, for the spouse to participate as well. And uh, we would also offer it to surviving spouses of military members who were killed on duty. Um, we're going to do it at locations nationwide. Probably, uh, most likely, the Department of Labor, American Job Centers. Um, that's our thought right now. We've also been talking to the VA. Um, and we have a formal procurement request out, and uh, we're in the process of carefully evaluating those proposals. So stay tuned on that one. Um, also, still talking about education initiatives, we do education for Department of Defense professionals who have the important task of providing advice and assistance to service members. Uh, we want to be sure they have the latest information so they give the right information. And we've done a series of video events tailored to JAGs, financial program managers, and education service officers. And we've covered things like student loan servicing issues to include compliance with the Service Members Civil Relief Act. We've seen some real problems there when folks enter the military with student loans and uh, don't get the right advice from their own servicer. Uh, we've also talked about the new mortgage servicing rules as they relate to the military, and last but not least, certainly debt collection issues. And for the next one, we're doing a video training tailored to the veteran service organizations and military service organizations. So if you're somebody who works in Massachusetts with military veterans, we hope you'll sign up for it at our listserv, which is an easy address to remember. It's military at cfpb.gov. 
Now, on to our mission to monitor the military complaints that come into the CFPB. CFPB, I think, has gotten um, several hundred thousand complaints now in the aggregate, but my office has two dedicated staff to actually provide military expertise on complaint monitoring, because we do have an identifier. If you file a complaint with us at consumerfinance.gov, we will ask you up front if you're military. And if you're military or a veteran or a family member, um, then that will flag you so my office can, can keep track of uh, the, figure, the numbers who come to us and the results. And one of my uh, staff who does that is a former JAG, so she definitely gets it, and she's been done, done a fabulous job of making sure we get it right. We do a military complaint report twice a year. Uh, we just did one, in fact, and I'll give you a ballpark idea. Uh, from July 2011, when we opened our doors through August of 2013, CFPB got about 14,000 complaints from service members, veterans, and their family members. Those complaint statistics certainly aren't just numbers to us. They represent military and veteran families, and we know the impact that consumer financial issues can have on their quality of life. I'll give you an example. In one complaint we got, a veteran was struggling with his bank for months over a fee of nearly $2,000 that should have been waived because he was disabled. Within weeks of his submitting a complaint to the Bureau, the bank removed the fee and refunded the veteran for the interest that was charged in error. So that's the kind of result we certainly love to see. We certainly don't promise that everybody who comes to us will get money back or even the resolution that they want, but since we started taking consumer cl complaints, we've seen almost a million dollars refunded to military veterans and their families as a result of their complaints to the CFPB. Our complaint, military complaint volume continues to increase, and um, I will tell you, debt collection is probably the fastest trending upward of the complaints that we're getting in right now. And obviously, the longer we can collect complaints, the richer the data that we can use to draw conclusions and provide helpful information. So, on to the last thing I said I'd do, which is work with uh, other federal and state agencies. Um, I've been out and about to about 70 military installations since I started this job, to include a trip in May of last year to bases in Japan, including Okinawa and South Korea. I go out partly to let service members and their families and those who work with them know who we are and what we do, but also to hear from them about their consumer financial issues. Um, it's important for me to hear from them because I do get called to testify in front of this body uh, eight times so far since I started this job. So when I get asked that question, what are you hearing, I want to have an answer that's really straight from the horse's mouth. And yes, I have been to Massachusetts. Um, I had the pleasure of doing a couple roundtables last September with Senator Warren and your Congresswoman, one at Bunker Hill Community College and the other at the famous UMass Lowell. Um, and I was very impressed with what I saw and what's being done in Massachusetts for the military and veterans who call it home. So what have I heard about on my travels? Um, one issue certainly has been the challenges for military homeowners over recent years. Uh, in particular, active duty service members who owned homes and saw them drop in value and go underwater uh, ended up being faced with a real dilemma when they got what are called permanent change of station or PCS orders. That's not like a combat deployment. That's actually when you get orders to move to another military base someplace else. And what do they do when they've got a house they can't sell for enough to pay it off? Um, PCS orders have a short timeline and military homeowners did not get the assistance that they needed, either in programs tailored to their circumstances or timely information about foreclosure alternatives. Um, I heard from military homeowners they've been told there was no help available, told they had to be delinquent on their mortgage before they could even qualify for help, and sometimes actually told to skip payments, asked to waive their rights under the Service Member Civil Relief Act in order to be evaluated, just evaluated for assistance, stalled with repeated demands for loan documents that had already been sent many times, routed to a different official with each call, denied the interest rate reduction or foreclosure protection that is a requirement of the Service Member Civil Relief Act, listed as failing to respond when they were deployed despite the fact that their spouse had a power of attorney and was providing the information to the servicer, and finally just given information about foreclosure alternatives too late to do any good. So we talked about these issues with a number of parties here in Washington, and we did see some progress. The national mortgage settlement between the federal government and 49 states and the five largest mortgage servicers um, did mandate lookbacks to see if they had complied with the Service Members Bill of Relief Act and compensation where they had not, and it also provided some short sale opportunities. 
And uh, the government-sponsored enterprises, you may know the names, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, also changed their guidance to say that a military PCS move is a qualifying hardship to get assistance from their um, loan modification or foreclosure prevention programs. We went further and we got them to change what's called the HAMP program. Um, they, there was another issue for military which really was what, that a lot of these programs expected the home to be owner-occupied. That makes sense, except when you're military. I myself uh, moved 24 times in 37 years. I've never occupied a house more than four years straight, and that only once in my life. So obviously, if you say owner-occupied, you're shutting the door to a lot of military families. And once Treasury understood that, to their credit, they changed their guidance. They said, OK, we will consider it owner-occupied as long as the homeowner does intend to come back to the house and they don't buy another house somewhere else. So that was exciting. And um, even more exciting, the acting director of the Federal Housing Finance Agency that oversees Fannie and Freddie came to the CFPB after we had these conversations and said, we have decided that if a service member has to do a short sale, in other words, sell the house for short of what they owe, because of a PCS move, and it's a Fannie or Freddie loan, we will forgive the difference. That's a big deal, a very big deal. And we were really excited about that, as you can imagine. And that went into effect in November of 2012. So I'm certainly hopeful that there are service members out there who have been helped by that. Mortgage loan servicing isn't the only thing that's uh, concerned us. We've seen really troubling signs of very similar practices when it comes to student loan servicing, including violations of the Service Member Civil Relief Act. In fact, I think sometimes the problems may be greater with student loans than it was with mortgages for the military, because I think many more young service members enter active duty with student loans than enter active duty with a mortgage. Makes sense, right? And um, we've heard them that they've had trouble invoking their rights. Sometimes they've been given very um, bad advice. Sometimes they just deny their rights. In other cases, um, are just told, oh, if you're going on active duty, you should just defer the loan. You don't have to pay at all. Well, that's, if it's not a federally subsidized loan, it's going to keep accruing interest the whole time you're not paying. So that is not great advice. You're going to come out with a nasty surprise at the other end. And sometimes the eligibility options are so complicated that they just have not really understood them very well. We have an office for students at the CFPB, and uh, they have some great resources out there now, including a student loan calculator on our website that includes the GI Bill. And um, I've also, frankly, been pretty vocal on the disproportionate share of GI Bill and tuition assistance money that's going into the coffers of for-profit colleges that market aggressively to the military. I think military and veteran students should be choosing a college based on which one will provide the best outcome for them not based on which one has the best marketing. And sadly, sometimes that's what happens. Um, we were excited last month to see the VA, Department of Defense, and Department of Education all together go live with student complaint systems that were mandated by a presidential executive order in April of 2012. They're modeled on our complaint system, and uh, we've been working closely with the other agencies on this. And we've heard the complaints are already flowing in. And we're certainly happy that those who use military and veterans education benefits now have a place to go if things go wrong. So please spread the word about the complaint system. If you work with anybody that is using military education benefits, um, there's a blog on our website, if all else fails, that I wrote about it, that you can read to find out where those links are. And let's see what else. Um, other things on our radar, perennial ones for the military, problems with car loans, um, I think there have been problems with that since they were driving chariots back in the Roman era. <laughs> it just doesn't go away. Um, also, small dollar, short-term loans, always an issue, and debt collection practices. And I will say, speaking of car loans, that the CFPB did have its first military-related enforcement action announced uh, in June of last year concerning a subprime auto lending program called Military, military Installment Loans and Educational Services, or MILES and it was offered um, by U.S. Bank and a partner company, Dealers Financial Services. And by the way, our investigation started because of a dad from Massachusetts whose son was in the military and got a really expensive loan, and the dad wrote us and said, how can this be right? Um, it was Harry and Harry, 
And uh, but what they turned it ended up in an enforcement action where the two companies had to return about six and a half million dollars to over 50,000 service members. So um, they, the Ari was getting out of the military and his dad went on a road trip to get him and they were driving back to Massachusetts and they stopped by our headquarters. So we were all able to save them with what you did. You know? It was an awesome moment really. Really pleased to be able to do that, not just for them, but for all those soldiers that they helped. So, small dollar short term loans, um, marketed to the military, all, I have, all you have to do, not right now because you're not on your smartphones right now, I know, um, but when you are, Google military loans and you will get about 55 million results, I did last week. And uh, although I realize payday loans are prohibited in Massachusetts, you're certainly going to be able to find lenders on the internet who are ready to offer pretty much any kind of loan. Many of them charge outrageously high interest rates in the triple and even quadruple digits. Um, I'll tell you about the worst one that I heard about, which was not in Massachusetts, but it was a service member who took out an auto title loan. That's where you borrow money, but you give them the title to your car to secure the loan. It was a loan of $1,600. It was a 32-month term, and the monthly payments were over $500. Ultimately, yes, doing the mental math, it was about a 400% interest rate, and he was going to be paying $15,000 in service charges for a $1,600 loan. And the real scandal, in a way, is that it wasn't illegal. It wasn't illegal under the Military Lending Act or that state's usury cap because it was for too, too much money. And for the Military Lending Act, it was for too long a period of time. So there's still work to be done, obviously. And areas like that. The Military Lending Act was intended to address some of the worst of the practices by limiting the interest rates on consumer credit to active duty service members and their dependents to an APR of 36%. A lot of people say it's 36%, that sounds really high, but the average payday loan um, is an APR of about 390%. So, sounds better now, doesn't it? Um, but that, the rule that implemented that law was defined pretty narrowly, and lenders have found it pretty easy to get around it. So in December, Congress made some changes. Um, one welcome one was that federal regulators that can enforce the Truth in Lending Act can now enforce the Military Lending Act, and that includes the CFPB. And we're now working with the Department of Defense uh, along with the Prudential regulators as they take another look at the terms of the rule that they wrote for that law to see whether or not they need to revamp it. Um, debt collectors doing a variety of nasty things, contacting the service member's chain of command as a way to coerce them to pay, you know, basically getting them in trouble. Um, and the service members here can tell us if somebody calls your boss and he comes to you and says, fix it, you're going to fix it, even if you don't know that debt. Um, sometimes they even put a clause in a loan contract that the service member has to give them the right to contact their commanding officer. They threaten punishment under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, threaten to have the service member busted in rank, or even to have their security clearance taken away. And uh, sometimes they even contact the spouse after deployment of the service member and pressure the spouse to pay right away. Um, and the worst one we heard about, this was in Tennessee, was demanding that the widow of a service member killed in combat pay them immediately from the combat get death gratuity. I wonder how low can people go? So we do have enforcement authority under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, and we've um, begun to supervise debt collectors that have annual receipts of over $10 million. And we're also um, looking at a proposed rule, and we took comments on that. Um, one last thing, I'm really almost done here. Um, our website does have something called Ask CFPB. We've got answers to over a thousand questions at this point about consumer financial issues and some of them are military specific. So if you have a question, I hope you go take a look. If you don't find your question, let us know and we will probably add it. Um, one interesting thing is that on our debt collection questions, we added a set of five sample letters that you could write to communicate to a debt collector. And we hope people have found those really helpful. So that's a quick, or maybe not so quick, look at what we do at the CFPB and what my office does specifically. And uh, if you're interested in following what we do, uh, again, you can join our listserv, military at cfpb.gov. You can also find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, at CFPB Military, and we'd certainly be happy if you joined the conversation. 
So I will close by saying thank you again to the Congresswoman for the invitation to come and talk to these great folks from Massachusetts and uh, tell you about what I do. And I'll just say that I feel very fortunate that I have the opportunity to serve as an advocate and a trusted source of information for our nation's military families who've given so much and served our country so well. And in turn, it's my honor to serve them. Thank you. some of the issues that 49 states had, had uh, signed on. I'm just wondering, what state wouldn't sign off to protect that? I think it was, I think it was Oklahoma, if I'm recalling correctly, and that Attorney General wanted to pursue it himself, okay. a separate settlement. So it wasn't, they weren't that playing, is. they just, uh, he was asking the National Mortgage Settlement, uh, I said 49 states, he was wondering which one didn't, didn't <laughs> sign on. So there's nothing sinister there, they actually, uh, the, the, their Attorney General just to do his own thing. And I will say, um, huge fan of the attorneys general and what they can do. I've had 16 of them personally go with me to military installations in their state. Um, your attorney general, Martha Coakley, has just recently gone after some folks uh, very aggressively. And remember uh, my great grandfather, who was the uh, Lizzie Borden guy? He later was the attorney general of Massachusetts, too. <laughs> Thank you. appreciate his leadership on behalf of the Commonwealth. He was elected in 1988 uh, to the first congressional district, which is made up of cities and towns throughout western and central Massachusetts. I know at one time he did represent some of the communities I now represent. So for example, Fitchburg at one time was in Congressman Neal's district. His excellence as a legislator has earned him a position on the Powerful Ways and Means Committee where he has become one of the leading voices on economic and tax policy for the House of Representatives, and I have to say, we hope to see him as chairman someday. Examples of his leadership are many. He was the lead sponsor of legislation to prevent American companies from moving offshore to avoid paying U.S. taxes. He continues in his efforts to repeal the alternative minimum tax, which penalizes many middle-class Americans and he has sponsored legislation that would increase the national savings rate, uh, a, an interest I share, by encouraging the use of individual retirement accounts. He is co-chairman of the New England Congressional Caucus, where he is a forceful advocate for the unique regional interests of the six New England states. And he also serves as the chairman of the Friends of Ireland. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Richie Neal. Thank you very much, Nikki, for those nice words of introduction, and thanks to all of you. Uh, Nikki is uh, clearly a very serious legislator, and she plays a very important role in the uh, New England delegation, given the fact that her armed services uh, perch becomes very important in terms of advocating, as you know, for one of the kind of unique aspects of the uh, New England economy. While we don't do a lot of military hardware construction, we do do most of the research. And she has zealously guarded that prerogative of the Congress, and I'm indeed grateful for her advocacy every day. When I was listening to uh, Petraeus, the previous speaker, I, I was kind of chuckling to myself. Uh, the federal district court judge uh, for the four counties of Western Massachusetts, Michael Ponzer, who was a very capable guy and a good friend to me, 
He's just written an interesting novel, and it is part of, uh, makes references to interest rates. He tells the story of uh, a fellow who was, we might say, falling behind on his debt and with pretty outrageous interest rates. And uh, he meets the local mob boss, and at that time he's south in Springfield, and the mob boss explains it like this. He said, well, uh, we're going to take your car. And the fellow says, well, who would want that car? I, it's old and I have a lot of payments on it. And the mob boss says, oh, no, no, you're going to keep making the payments. We're just going to take the car. <laughs> I thought that kind of summed up the uh, description that was made earlier. Now, as Nikki indicated by way of introduction, uh, your committee of Congress is destiny. It's where you really make your mark over a long period of time. It doesn't mean you're always going to prevail in the intervening arguments, but it does mean that with a period of time in which people come to see and hear from you, that they come to understand that, in fact, the arguments that you make are well thought through. So when you conclude your remarks, what you want people to always say is not that you necessarily agree or disagree, as much as you might say, well, gee, so-and-so knows what they're talking about. So we're just coming off a period of time in which the uh, chairman of my committee, Dave Camp, who is a very good friend of mine, a Republican, he has just authored a very substantive tax reform proposal. And to show you how hard it is to do tax reform, and the reason we have not done it since 1986, it's because when you do tax reform, there's extraordinary pushback. And like all of you here, you all would say to me with a nod of affirmation, you need to change the tax code. And then when we would lay out for you how we might go about changing the tax code, I would guess that probably at least half of you in the room would vigorously disagree with the proposals that are offered. Now, I've had a unique opportunity. Uh, I went to the Ways and Means Committee as a very young member of Congress. And I'd like to say it was the genius of my tax knowledge, but it really was because in our delegation, everybody sits on a good committee. Now, that legacy dates to Speaker McCormick, to Speaker O'Neill, and Chairman Moulton. And as you move to these committees, Longevity becomes very important. And I know that that is not an honor that a lot of people embrace these days, but I will submit this to you. You're better off with a legislator who has an institutional memory and understands how decisions have been rendered in the past. So as Chairman Camp set out to do tax reform, he embraced an interesting model. He brought the stakeholders across the board for just about every conceivable issue into a room without the cameras, and without formal testimony, and people were invited to defend the preference, exclusion, or deduction in the code. The result was that Chairman Camp came back with a proposal that began with democratic influence, where we were able to make our own requests, that in a lot of ways uh, was not met with favor on his own side. We took a more judicious approach, largely at my urging, to say, he should get two cheers for at least having had the courage to put something in documentation in front of the American people. The only part of the Republican base in America that embraced Chairman Camp's proposal was the Wall Street Journal editorial board. So he did a number of interesting things that you would not have thought a Republican chairman would have offered. First of all, he tackled the issue of second mortgages above $500,000 in their deduction. Secondly, he offered a bank tax to further the issue of the unwinding of many of our major institutions. That was not well met by banking interest. And thirdly, he offered a surcharge on incomes for joint filers above $450,000. Now, now, why is that interesting for a Republican chairman to do? Because no matter how you square it, if you start from a position of revenue neutrality, you come to the following conclusion. Revenue as a percent of gross domestic product in America right now is about 16%. <coughs> it was at 15% until we reached the tax accord with Chairman Camp and Speaker Boehner on New Year's Eve a year and a half ago. We took the top rates, as many of you know, back to 39.6, or as we call them, the Clinton rates. Now, I call that to your attention because prior to having tackled that issue, we were headed toward the Truman years in terms of revenue as a percent of gross domestic product, not toward the Kennedy years. 
We have argued in this town in the post-war period as to whether or not revenue ought to be at 19 cents on the dollar or 21 cents on the dollar. So I would submit to you today that the tax cuts that President Bush offered in 2001, a trillion, three hundred million dollars, and then a trillion dollars in 2003, coupled with two wars and an economic downturn that is now five years old, has put us in a precarious position. And I would also say this to you as a long-serving member. You cannot cut your way out of this, and you cannot raise taxes to get your way out of this. There is going to be, at some point, a combination. So to Camp's credit, he tried to tackle the issue on the corporate side. On the personal side, he was not quite as vigorous. So on the corporate side, corporations argued vociferously that if we took that corporate rate to 25%, that they would be in favor of ending exclusions, deductions, and preferences in the code. He did that. It didn't work very well. Because many of them said, well, if we have the options here, we'll prefer keeping the deductions. I could have forewarned that that was going to happen. We laid out a counter argument that said, if you go to 28%, you can pair back some of these deductions, exclusions, and preferences in the code. If you go to a flat 25% rate, it can't be done. Now, understand that the real effective rate in America, elasticity, is probably closer to 14 to 15% that is paid. You always have these kind of arguments in America between interests. And the interest could be the AFL CIO, it could be the individual taxpayer, it could be the corporations. It's always this competing arena in which the ideas clash. So the multinationals, with some justification, took the argument that they wanted a rate that was competitive on a worldwide basis. <coughs> Domestic interests took the position, we want the corporate rate cut based upon domestic assessment. The problem with that argument is, one came to believe that they were going to pay for the other. And that generally doesn't move a tax argument forward. So the multinationals would argue right now, under what is known as subpart F, which some of you are well aware of, that intangible assets and cash, they are sitting on $2 trillion internationally. They would like to figure out how to bring that money back to America. Obviously, they'd like to bring it back at a preferred rate. Now, the challenge for us is to how to make that money productive domestically. The difficulty is their competitors in America say, why should they have a rate five years ago that brought the money back at five and a quarter when we sometimes pay 35%, which is frequently the argument the financial services industry will say. They'll, they will say, no matter what we do, we can't get below 28 or 29 percent. So consider that the corporate bottom line in America right now is stronger than it's been in five years. They're sitting on a lot of money trying to figure out what to do with it. And internationally, they're sitting on $2 trillion trying to figure out how to return it. And that was part of Camp's proposal. He said, let them bring the money back at 8.8 percent on cash and on tangible assets, 3.3 percent. So that part of it, again, complicates the argument. Now, my suspicion here is, given where we find ourselves in an election cycle, we are probably not going to make a lot of headway on tax reform this year. That's the simplicity of it. I addressed the Mass Mutual Board of Directors yesterday in Springfield, and so we went back and forth on these issues. And you should know, like Nikki, I am a pro-growth Democrat. I don't buy the argument that tax cuts pay for themselves. I do buy the argument that at certain intervals of economic reality, some tax cuts are better than others. So I do think that you can jumpstart or juice the economy from time to time with tax cuts. But I don't subscribe to the argument that across the board tax cuts will always engender more revenue that comes to the federal government. There is no evidence to support that conclusion. So how do we get this money off the sidelines into productive capacity right now? And that's the challenge that Congress faces. And I would dare say that uh, growth remains pretty tech. Demand is very weak. There is good news on the homeowner front, but really not spectacular news on the homeowner front. 
There is good news on people getting rid of credit card debt. Not a lot of news that they're taking the second foot into the water. So again, an indication that they're all sitting on the sidelines. The other issue I think that uh, complicates this is that when we voted to raise the debt ceiling, which as you saw was an example of the paralysis that impacts the modern Congress, the Speaker of the House who was a decent, decent guy, and I've known him for a long, long period of time, offered the edict that he wanted that debt ceiling raised. There were 27 Republicans that agreed with him. Now let me just tell you, from Tip to Jim Wright, you didn't vote to raise the debt ceiling. The Speaker ushered in that. You'd be looking for a new committee assignment. That would be the end of it. Period. And in Boehner's case, his inability to get his own caucus to agree with them demonstrates the role that the primary now plays in American elections. They're fearful of a threat within their own party. Now let me be so bold as to assert this. If you were willing to vote for the war in Iraq, you should be willing to raise that debt ceiling. Because that's what this is about. No? Thank you for that. One person of applause. Uh, I'm overwhelmed with the trend. Uh, but you're right. And But the point that I raise is the following. A million new veterans, trillion dollars of borrowed money for the war in Iraq. It's a legacy issue. It has to be paid for. And the idea that you can simultaneously have huge tax cuts and engage two wars internationally, given the injuries that our men and women are coming back with. They deserve our support, as you heard a moment ago from Stratus. They deserve the honor with which we set them off to pay for the responsibility that we have to care for them when they come back. That's the simplicity of the argument. They serve us with honor. They signed up. We should take care of the responsibilities that we have. And I think that's, again, part of the difficulty you have in the modern economy. Last point, I'll take a couple of questions. Nothing helped Bill Clinton more than a 3.8% unemployment rate. He regularly polls north of 60% in his approval rate. Why? Because people had a job. Our focus here should be almost exclusively on getting people back to work. That unemployment rate that is advertised at 6.8%, Probably closer to eight and a half to nine percent. Probably closer to thirteen to fourteen million people who are without work. There are some real discouraging parts of this unemployment cycle, and much of it has to do with males at the lower end of the economic spectrum. It's globalization, it's international trade, it's the lack of organization, it's the lack of I'm getting a signal. We're voting on issuing a subpoena from the Ways and Means Committee. Another principle that. Uh, and the point is that in many of our urban areas now, there's a very chronic problem with unemployment. And, and we've got to come to grips with it. And I don't know how much time my staff fellow is going to tell me I have. Two minutes. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs>
uh, Dominicans um, and a great community. He was mayor of here today. Oh, Madam, good. And my husband Paul uh, and my daughter Ashley both have a tradition of Peace Corps service, so I know what an invaluable, life changing several years that can be. Uh, Joe currently sits on the Committee on Foreign Affairs and the Committee on Science and Technology. And just this week, he led an effort with Governor Patrick, Mayor Walsh, and the entire delegation to promote Prescription Drug Take Back Day on April 26th. It's my pleasure to introduce him. He is no longer the most junior member of the delegation. And, <laughs> and I can say that since I remember the day that Bill Keating was elected not that long ago, and I was proud to give up my role as the most junior member, Joe Kennedy. additional perks about being a member of Congress is that one person gets sick, we all huddle, we then disperse to every part of the country, we get up and we come back. So, uh, it, without everything else, we're a bit of a petri dish, so apologies uh, if you can't hear me. Um, it has been an unbelievable uh, year, four, four months here, six months or so for me, and I can't tell you, I, I could not have, um, you, you realize very quickly how dependent you are on good friends that are able to literally show you where the bathrooms are, um, how to walk from the railroad building over to the house court of a boat, and I still get lost. And Nikki has been there for me literally every step of the way. I'm going to get a little, a couple more stories about that in a second, but um, Nikki is uh, thrilled to be here for me. Uh, I see you brought the entire district down, which is great. So, <laughs> and I'm um, happy to just share a little bit about uh, insights or so from my first couple of months in office. <clears throat> when I first got elected, I told some of you, uh, Story, but I think I liked it. A buddy of mine on a swearing in day sent me an email and she said, Congratulations, that was my best And I opened up and it was a link to a poll that showed that members of Congress in Congress was at that point less popular than root canals, colonoscopies, process pressure. <laughs> <laughs> but that our pool work had doubled to 18%. I figured from there it was, it could only go up. So I a communication person showed me a poll uh, just recently which showed that Irish optimism in me was perhaps a bit misfounded. We've uh, sunk to the levels um, below. I think the only thing we have beat at this point was Miley Cyrus and serial killers. <laughs> Even below cockroaches, which is uh, really sad. So it's been a, uh, an interesting year and a half or so to say the least. But um, th those first couple months trying to literally figure out how to get over the house floor, trying to uh, understand the committee and the committee process trying to understand how you, you hire staff and, and really get your feet on solid footing. You are so dependent on some good friends to point you in the right direction and to just slow things down. And uh, Nikki has done that for me time and time again. One of the first big challenges that I confronted was actually a, a, a big contractor in my district. Uh, a program that the military set, a, a valuable communications program that the military wanted to put potentially on the chopping block. Uh, Nikki came down to my district for the site together, and because of her efforts, we got the program saved. It saved thousands of jobs in my district, and provided a valuable communications program that the military said we wanted and needed and was designed for combat in uh, Afghanistan. And so, uh, for somebody that is brand new, to be able to, to lean on somebody from the beginning to literally not just show you how it's done, but to actually go out and do it, and then uh, to share even though she deserves all of that, to share most of that credit with me, um, was extraordinary. So, um, <laughs> you, this, Washington can be an interesting place sometimes. I always, I found that the first, uh, again, a couple of months, it's extremely valuable to see how other members react to other members, and to see who they trust, to see who they will go to on certain issues. And that, I think, really is where uh, your member of Congress stands in the heart. The integrity that she displays, the respect that she has amongst her colleagues, not just in the Massachusetts delegation, but in the delegation, uh, the members of her committee, is extraordinary. And that's not something that is given, that is something that is not. And that is something that Nikki is able to deliver for her district each and every day that she serves her. And it's literally something for somebody brand new to show how you, you do it right, do it well, and something to aspire to. And so, Nikki, I just want to thank you, um, not just for 
the ins and outs of the job that you uh, have shown me how to, how to get it done. But for, I think most importantly, the character that you display as you do, because it is that, that in the long run is worth so much more than trying to get a lot of research. Uh, but it's what brings people together, it's what gets people online. So thank you. Uh, I guess I'll just close by saying it's, a, um, it's an interesting time to be in Washington. Um, parts of the job are fantastic, parts of the job are less fantastic, but um, all in all, it's been a, an extraordinary place. And I guess I'd just say that the vast majority of my colleagues, I think, are good and decent people that are trying to do the right thing or what they believe is the right thing. We don't always agree on what that is, so no argument. Um, and I think you'll, those of you that are going to be down on the House floor, over the course of today, we're already going to see some of that debate as we discuss various budget proposals that will be going on uh, in the next 24 hours or so. Um, it's been a, uh, you, you get an appreciation for how big the country is, how diverse the country is, and um, the fact that that diversity is something that, yes, we should celebrate, but at times um, that partisanship, we really have to find a way to come together. And again, that's really where I think our students are going to be. So I'm thrilled to be here. I'm happy to, um, that, to see so many of you.
can see it's great to have uh, Joe Kennedy as part of the delegation. I was looking at him and I think he's for the youngest and the oldest. So what can I do? <laughs> <laughs> now, that our dean has, now that our dean has made his way over to the United States Senate, but um, yes, it's been an honor to serve with Joe. And uh, as much as we need people here with experience and depth of knowledge which accumulate over time, it's also true that we need to be constantly reinvigorated by young people who are coming in with a whole set of different experiences, products of a different time, and it's, it's great to have uh, Congressman Kennedy join us. Uh, I'd now like to introduce our senator, uh, our junior senator from Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> But our loss in the House of Representatives, I do believe, is the Senate and the Commonwealth's gain. Ed Erd, uh, served 37 years in the United States House of Representatives before being elected to the Senate last year. With a proven record and tremendous institutional knowledge, I think Ed is a real asset to uh, the United States Senate. His unparalleled experience has helped advance clean energy initiatives that create jobs, protect the environment, and lower our dependence on foreign oil. He co-authored the Waxman Markey American Clean Energy and Security Act, which I was proud to be just elected into Congress in time to support as it was approved in June of 2009. Is that right? Yeah. And I have seen firsthand the effectiveness of his advocacy as a member of the Natural Resources Committee, on which I also serve, where Ed was until his departure to the Senate, the highest ranking Democrat. And on another front, he has worked to expand broadband internet access and to help grow our state high-tech industry. And, and I was proud to work with Ed in expanding one of the most effective programs in the federal government to provide seed money to our nation's most innovative small growth companies, so many of which are in Massachusetts and many of which are represented here today. So please join me in welcoming our junior senator, Ed Martin. <laughs> I love being called junior. And, uh, uh, hasn't happened in a while, and uh, I thank um, Nikki for inviting me over here. Um, Forty years ago, I was starting with Paul Songus, uh, the great Paul Songus, and now I serve in the United States Senate in the seat that Paul Songus served, and that is an incredible honor for me to have that responsibility. And, uh, and it's a great honor to serve with Nikki, you know, who is just a continuation of this superior Sungus uh, political <laughs> legacy uh, in the Merrimack Valley and beyond. And so uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity to uh, be with you here today. Uh, we are an innovation economy. Um, since my Grandfather worked up in the mills of Lawrence. Uh, it was innovation that pulled the Markeys to uh, Massachusetts, and it is innovation which continues to draw people to our economy. And uh, and we are constantly reinventing ourselves. And the blue perfect form of that uh, reinvention actually occurred just last week when. Big Poppy was using a camera to take a selfie of himself with the presidency. <laughs> we're really involved uh, in terms of our relationship with uh, technology. So we essentially have a business plan in Massachusetts, uh, and it revolves around a three-point program. Number one, uh, we uh, we educate at the best universities uh, in the world, including UMass Lowell. And we work hard to keep the kids who we train at these schools in Massachusetts. Number two, we give them access to the capital which they need in order to be able to create jobs within our state. And third, we give them a world-class workforce uh, in order to make sure that what it is that those companies are doing, uh, in fact, can compete in a national and a global market. That's our business plan. One, two, three. It's very simple. So what UMass Lowell represents under Monty Meehan's leadership uh, is this ever-increasing now up to 16,000 students with ever-higher standards 
uh, with innovation and technology being the focus, with business being a focus, um, with uh, uh, with uh, beating Boston College in the frozen uh, <laughs> pool, the focus um, that the goal of excellence is what he is focusing on, what the school is focusing on. And how does it then play out? Well, it plays out um, in this way. One, uh, we receive more NIH grants per capita than any other state in the United States. That's where the money goes. Number two, we are now the clean tech growth capital. There are now 5,000 companies with 80,000 jobs in Massachusetts in the clean tech sector. That did not exist just six or seven years ago, just growing rapidly. We have no oil, we have no gas, we have no coal. We have the minds of people who live within our state. That is and always has been our greatest asset. Number three, we focus upon the telecom tech sector. All these kids with this skill set uh, increasingly uh, uh, want to play a role in further using this computer, this telecom, this interconnectivity skill set as a way of innovating the economy. And there we're a capital as well. And so the good news is that. 10% um, of the kids who go to MIT come from Massachusetts, 35% stay in Massachusetts. 20% of the kids who go to Tufts come from Massachusetts, 50% stay. 85% of the kids who go to UMass Lowell stay, stay, stay. That's our business plan. Send us your best young talent from other states. We will take them, we will train them, we will keep them in our high-tech economy. And out of that comes the new buildings that have to be constructed for the biotech, for the clean tech, for the healthcare, for the telecom tech. And there you need, as a result, the iron workers and the steel workers. You need, uh, you need to ensure that you have the accountants and the architects. You have to make sure that throughout the rest of this plan that everyone else is employed as well. And we are, without question, a state with a business plan. And it is working. Now, it is not working as well as we would like it to work. That is who we are. So even though at the 4th, 8th, and 10th grades, Massachusetts kids are number one in the country in math, verbal, and science. Math, verbal, and science, 4th, 8th, and 10th grades, Massachusetts is number one. And we're not happy. We know we have to do even better. We know that we have to continue to keep this lead, but we also know something else, that it serves as a magnet for uh, younger people who are out of college to say, I think I'll stay here in this state because I can put my kids in a public school system that's going to get them, that my children, into a school uh, that is equal to or better than the one that I went to as a parent. Huh? That's all part of who we are. And so, um, Nikki and I, uh, we, you know, my father used to say to me, Eddie, uh, when two people agree upon absolutely everything, you don't need one of those people. <laughs> but he wasn't talking about the United States Congress. Okay? You, need, you need a lot of people agreeing in order to battle the kind of ideas that you heard Joe Kennedy talking about, you know, just with Sugar and I. Still. So you just have to understand who it is that we are and make sure that um, uh, we fight for, um, for what we believe in. So for me, uh, that's what I'm doing over in the Senate. I was 37 years in the House of Representatives. Out of the 10,850 people who had ever served in the House of Representatives over here, I cast the 11th largest number of votes out of 10,850 members of the House in history. But I felt that uh, I could go over and partner with Elizabeth, you know, to provide the leadership that Paul Songus and John Kerry and Ted Kennedy had been providing over these last generations. And I thought it was very important for the state and for our economic growth to have our voices be heard over there. When I was a boy, I used to lie on the rug and watch John F. Kennedy, you know, on television. And my father was a milkman for the Hood Milk Company. And uh, my mother would say to me, Eddie, I, 
I married an old man, but I'm not raising any. <laughs> and, uh, and it was clear that there was a set of aspirational goals huh, that were being created in a generation to allow people to take advantage of the opportunities that were being created in the state of Massachusetts at that time. Uh, and to have that seat, you know, that John F. Kennedy had, that Paul Sonnen said, it's a pretty good story. And in January of last year, right after I announced, I decided to go up to Lawrence and ring the doorbell in 88 Phillips Street in South Lawrence, where my father grew up with his four brothers and sisters, where the family worked in the South Mill, in this triple decker that is just in the shadow of the South Mill in South Lawrence. And so I just wanted to see where did he grow up? Where did my father grow up? With his four brothers and sisters. And so I rang the doorbell, and out onto the porch came a Dominican couple with their parents. And the accents were different, but the aspirations the same. For that family has existed for the market. And it is a great country when the son of someone who grew up there can be in the United States. And so it's our job as the Massachusetts delegation, it's our job as the state of Massachusetts to continue to lift the gaze of this country to the constellation of possibilities for every child, on every porch, in every city, in every town, in our country. And that the 21st century is more fair, more educated, more healthy, more clean, and more prosperous than the 20th century was. That's what the 21st century should be. And that's what we try to do down here on a daily basis. That's what Nikki and I talk about on a daily basis. How can we achieve those goals for every single person in our Commonwealth? in our country and in our world. And I thank each of you for everything you do in order to help to make that dream possible in our state. So thank you all so much. And so, um, if you want, I would be more than willing to take questions about any subject you would like. Yes, sir. So first of all, Can like you stand up and just speak up? Yeah. First of all, I'd like everybody in the room who doesn't know to know that you are a leading champion in Congress of the fight against Alzheimer's disease. Thank you. And we do appreciate that. Okay, thank you. And, and that's a very good question. And that's and that's us in a nutshell. That's Massachusetts in a nutshell. Mr. Mayor, and I'm going to be partnering with Mayor Rivera. Up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to tell one little story here, if I may. Um, my father graduated from the vocational program at Lawrence High School. Uh, 1929, he graduated. Not a good year to be graduating from high school. 1929. Huh? Not a good year. Um, in 1926, my grandmother died in Malden uh, on my mother's side. My grandmother died. She had five daughters. And so my mother, who was going to be valedictorian as a junior in high school heading into her senior year, she had to just stay home and raise all the younger sisters. Huh? That was the social safety net before Franklin Delano was born. And so she had to raise the family. So when she got married, she was 37. And... Uh, and she married the milkman, my father. Because that's where he had gotten a job in Malden, coming down on the train from Lawrence. It goes through Malden, got a job. In and, uh, and my mother contracted Alzheimer's. So I grew up with my brothers. I grew up in a house with uh, a valedictorian and the milkman. So I heard a polysyllabic and a monosyllabic answer to every question in the which is a good way to grow up. Um, and um, my mother contracted Alzheimer's. My father used to say to me, I said to my father at one point, should we think about putting Ma in a nursing home? And my father said, you know, Eddie, it was an honor that your mother married me. Your mother is never going to stop working in nursing home. And the right arm of a milkman has the strength of an ox. <laughs> Six milkwalks up and down, three deckers. Year after year. You just have no idea. And you don't want to be on the wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and 
so at age 78, 80, 82, 84, 86, 88, 90, my mother just stayed in the living room. And as you know, it just gets worse and worse. And there we were in Malta. And uh, the Republicans, in their control of the Congress and the White House, they cut the NIH budget by 18% from 2001 through 2009, which is absolutely unbelievable. Because the real terrorist threat that people fear is the call they're going to get that another member of their family has that disease, which is the running through their family system. They're really not afraid on a daily basis that some other global terrorist is going to happen. It's that disease. And so um, the NIH, yeah, they're the National Institutes of Health, but they're the National Institutes of Hope as well, because research is medicine's field of dreams from which we harvest the findings that give hope to families, <coughs> that we can find the cure for those diseases, that children will have to look to the history books to find that there ever was such a disease as Alzheimer's, diabetes, cancer, all the way down. That's who we are. That's Massachusetts. That's what we want this group of young people to be working on. That's why we have to invest more in research, in education. That should be our contribution to build upon what previous generations have given to our society. And so, and I can finish up this. So the, the way I view it is that I know how fortunate I am, Mr. Mayor, and my father always let me know that from Lawrence. Uh, how fortunate I was. Um, but when President Kennedy said that we were going to put a man on the moon and return him in eight years, and we we're going to invent new metals, new propulsion systems, we we're going to teach the Soviets a lesson, we all knew that that was the challenge of the country. I knew that as a boy. And we did that. And when that flag planted on the moon, that flag said U.S. technological superiority. That's what it said to the world. And the flag that actually flew on the moon is here in the Capitol. And it hangs in the Capitol, the flag that was on the moon. That's our return on investment. Huh? With the American people. And so, going forward, that's our responsibility as well. When the Apollo mission was, mission was failing, and, uh, and that rocket was falling back to Earth because something had gone wrong technologically in that ship and they had to figure out with the materials on board how they were going to redo the wiring to make sure that it could work. And Tom Hanks was up there. <laughs> <laughs> well, something's gone wrong with the brains. Five million people are going to have Alzheimer's. Five million baby girls. Plus there's another family member that has a good huh? That's ten million people who are having that's crazy. And you want to throw in Parkinson's and ALS, and autism. Let's throw them all in, huh? What's going wrong with the wiring? And so for this generation, for this century, we don't need a mission to the moon. We need a mission to the mind. We need to make the investment so that we can solve this crisis which has hit our country. And here's the number. Last year, $131 billion was spent on Alzheimer's, Medicare and Medicaid. $131 billion, that's one quarter of the entire defense budget. By the time all the baby boomers have retired, it will equal the defense budget. One disease to care for the people who have it in our country. We do not have an option. Failure is not an option. We must cure this disease. We must double the NIH budget so that we unleash all of the talent in our country, all of the young people who want to dedicate their lives, not to writing algorithms for hedge funds, but doing the scientific and technological research that can change not only our own country, but the whole country. And so thank you so much, sir, because uh, it is a <laughs> I have been given the hook, and um, uh, and uh, and I thank you all so much for what you do for our state, and uh, uh, and I just can't tell you, Nikki is uh, a superstar, and it's my honor to be able to partner with her on a basis. Thank you all so much.